Good morning, everyone. Really grateful to be here, and I'm really feeling grateful that this particular conversation is happening at this particular moment in history. Because I know I'm not alone when I say that so often I read the newspapers in the morning and I'm working through grief about what's happening in the world, feeling a lot of struggle and challenge as I think about the loss of forests and the fires in the Amazon and as I think about so many people feeling alienation in the economy and addiction and mental illness and all of these challenges that we're facing. And what gives me hope, what gives me a sense of feeling of confidence that we can make it through, is thinking about a new narrative, a new story for humanity as to how we're going to make it forward. And that's fundamentally what this idea that Kim brought forward this morning of the right to belong, what this vision of two-eyed seeing that our elder Albert Marshall brought this morning as well, of how it is that we could put forward a new narrative as to get through all of these different challenges, a new story for humanity right now. And what I love is that that story isn't just some ideology or just some intellectual framework. It's a narrative that has feeling to it, that has heart, because every one of us really longs to feel this sense of belonging this sense of connection in our work lives, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in the environment, this kind of connection to people, place, power, and purpose in the world. So we heard earlier from, from Kim, as she was speaking in her opening remarks, that there are multiple levels to this work of building belonging. First and foremost, as she described, it's a moral vision. It's a set of principles that can bring us together to think about this new narrative for making it, making it through in this, these challenging times. But there are also levels to which it's about social and economic policy. And there are also some levels of it that are about real legal reforms, thinking about the new global human rights, the new global institutional reforms and rights and changes that we need. So right now in this panel, we're gonna to start to get specific. We're gonna to start to think, what does this actually mean in practice to enshrine this right to belong? And we're gonna hear from folks who are on the front lines working in defense of forced migrants who've lost their home, indigenous people whose land has been destroyed and disrespected, the rights of older persons, persons with disabilities, to really put the pieces together and start to make this as real as we can. Um, so we're gonna start with some opening remarks from a really distinguished scholar and advocate and activist. Bill Alford is going to be joining us, um, is gonna be joining us by video, and he's the Cohen Professor of Law at Harvard University, as well as a Vice Dean of Harvard Law School and the Chair of the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors of Special Olympics International. And um, do we have Bill on the line? Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Justin, and thank you, Kim, for inviting me to participate. I'm really sorry that I'm not able to be there in person due to a medical issue. Uh, given my background as a law professor, Kim asked me to speak briefly about inclusion and belonging as a right. So here goes. I think that rights emerge from our core humanity and as such they transcend what states do or don't do. But I'm also a realist and I know that the articulation of rights and certainly their realization from World War II onward are very much a product of struggle. Think for example of the area of disability or different ability in which Kim and so many of us are engaged. 40 years ago, the model of disability was a charitable or medical one that largely did not include rights. But the challenges that an individual might face having a disability were a matter of fate and that whatever society did was a matter of its goodwill. The passage of national laws in the US, Canada, many other countries, and more importantly, the passage of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2006 
in which Ambassador Luis Gallegos so involved has really begun to change that by empowering people with rights and stressing that society has an obligation to make them a reality. So what would this mean for a right to inclusion and belonging? Some people may react by saying, we can't order people to embrace others unless they already want to. But inspired by Kim and others, I would suggest that we think of it differently. What we can do is, as with disability, use the idea of a right to push changes both in the societal structures that shape behavior so that they can better facilitate real inclusion and in how people think about their responsibilities to each other so that inclusion is not seen as the luxury or favor or charity but as something to which all of us are entitled by virtue of our humanity and so that we can appreciate how much better we all are for it. So I don't in any way want to interfere with uh, what others have prepared for the panel, but perhaps as appropriate, let me suggest a few things we can be thinking about today and going forward. And I look forward to participating in more conversations. So first, what should we be including in such a right? Secondly, how do we think about restructuring society to be more genuinely inclusive? And how do we do that thought process in a genuinely inclusive manner? To me, inclusion and belonging mean much more than simply adding people to existing structures. Rather, it means being willing to transform those structures themselves if necessary. The process of thinking about what needs to be done itself is a microcosm of the very issue. And so it needs to be highly inclusive from the get-go. Here, the very active participation of persons with disabilities and of disabled persons organizations in the CRPD and the UN Convention offers some real guidance. Third, how do we work to create a different consciousness about inclusion and belonging? Here, Special Olympics has been nothing short of amazing in helping us appreciate the gifts of our athletes, gifts of determination, creativity, friendship, adaptability, courage, and much more. As Tim Triver says, in a world of division, our athletes are leaders and inspirations, growing out our better selves. Kim's work is really pioneering here. Her presentation last year at Harvard was terrific with students rapidly attentive. So how do we build on this type of thing to foster ever greater public participation and why this matters so much? Fourth, what are the remedies that we will need to make this new right vibrant? For a right without a remedy can be very frustrating. I should say that if we look at innovative courts around the world, such as the South African Constitutional Court, you can see a variety of approaches from traditional orders and mandates from a court to moral admonitions, to efforts to engage with other parts of government in a dialogic process to advance social, economic, and cultural rights. So I think we wanna be creative in thinking about remedies. And finally, um, although I am all for articulating further rights for the reasons already suggested, I do think it's important we be aware that rights themselves are not a panacea. At least as articulated in the United States, rights themselves sometimes can be isolating, leaving it to individuals to vindicate the, what they believe uh, they are entitled to rather than society seeing it as a collective responsibility. So how best to capture what's most valuable in the year of a new right without having its more baleful impact? So thank you very much for hearing me out and I look forward to hearing the next panelists. Thank you. Bill, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I think you really captured the essence of so much of what we're trying to do here, which is not just bring new people into structures, but change 
those structures themselves to build belonging and change the way we relate as people as well. So I'd like to now call up our, our panelists. Uh, Jean-Nicolas Bouz works with UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, Bethany Brown with Human Rights Watch. And Kluani Adamek, who's the regional chief of the, uh, for the Assembly of First Nations for the Yukon region. So we'll get started just with a framing question. Going from the big picture vision that Kim laid out this morning and these principles that our elder Albert Marshall laid out as well, what does the right to belong mean to each of you within your specific field of work, grounded within the work that you're doing in your respected areas? We'll start with jean Nicolas. Thank you very much and very happy to, to be with all of you this morning. Thank you for the invitation, Kim, and, and, and the team. So let me start with, um, I work for the UN Refugee Agency, but I'm not going to speak about refugee first. I'm going to speak about another category, stateless people, people who have not been recognized by any uh, state. And Bill reminded us that the rights as the foundation of our access to education, to uh, any kind of public services, health, and so on. F and that is given through our belonging, in a way, as a citizen to a state. We believe that there is between four and 10 million people who are stateless, mainly in Asia, but also in the Middle East. For them, we, we are speaking about the Rohingya, for example, in Myanmar. We are speaking about the Bedouin in the Middle East, nomadic people. But here in North America, let's not forget, we have stateless people. Here in Canada, we have a number of people who cannot claim uh, their right to uh, citizenship, to be recognized as citizens of this country. Indigenous uh, and First Nation people, uh, people who have been deprived one way or other of their, of their right. In the, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, it's often through discrimination against gender. Women cannot pass on their nationality to their children. Nomadic people have difficulties being recognized by one state or the others. For them, they want to belong. We launch a campaign with their voice, and the campaign is hashtag I belong. They want to be part of a nation, they want to be recognized as citizens, they want to have a passport to travel or to open a bank account or to have their degree recognized. Not all, I need to put a caveat, for some people, including First Nation and Indigenous, not being recognized as a citizen of the state is a political act. And we need to recognize that not all of them wants to, to belong. Now I turn to the refugees, the big population that uh, my agency is also uh, interested with. It's much more complicated for them. A lot of refugees do not want to belong to the refugee category. They see it as a stain on their dignity. Syrian uh, refugees, we all know about the, 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 the horrendous violence in Syria, most of them have been displaced four times within their own country before crossing an international border and becoming a refugee. A refugee is somebody who is outside his or her country of origin. They don't want to leave because they belong to Syria and they don't want to become refugees. Many of them have told me, I'm not a refugee. I'm not opposed to the government. I just left because my house was bombed because my mother was killed because I didn't have any livelihood opportunities, but it's difficult for them to belong to this mass uh, that we call refugees. And for me as a lawyer and a humanitarian, it's important we recognize them as refugees because it gives them rights. It gives them the right to be where they are and not to be forced to be back uh, to their uh, places of origin, their, their home. But for many refugees, it's, a, it's difficult to accept that they belong no to this big uh, label called refugees. A number of them don't want to belong to the communities that have hosted them. And the host communities don't want them to belong. They, want, they, are happy, they may not be happy, but they are willing to open their door and to help them for a temporary period. But they want also people to, uh, to return home, which is their utmost desire. So what does that mean 
to belong when you are in a refugee, to belong to, you belong to what? To, to this big group of 26 million refugees and 45 million internally displaced? Do you belong to the new community who has accepted you, but only temporarily with often tension? Not always, a lot of countries in the South are extremely good, at, uh, and communities in the global South are extremely good at helping others, much more than us, the Western world, I must say these days. So for refugees, the concept of belonging is probably something much more complicated to, to unpack. Thank you. I am really excited to be here to talk with you all today. I am a researcher on older people's rights at Human Rights Watch. We are living in an incredible time where never before in human history have so many older people been alive at the same time as people of other ages. In we, we can see a doubling of the percentage of older people. So where countries that might have had 10% of their population being older people 15 years ago, in 10 years it might be 20%. One in five people can be over the age of 60 or over the age of 55. Age is just a number after all. But what that means is that issues of ageism, discrimination against people based on their perceived older age or their actual older age become magnified. The urgency that exists, the intensity that exists around these questions of how we are going to change the shape of our societies to incorporate more people that are living longer, that are older, is one of the greatest questions of our time. Human Rights Watch is the first mainstream human rights organization to take up the issue of older people's rights. And we are very proud to be partnering with the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness on the issues around social isolation and belonging in a really particular area of older people's rights. Human Rights Watch has a very long history of doing work on the rights of people that are in institutions. That's people like prisoners in prison or people in psychiatric institutions or children in orphanages. And we also do work on older people's rights in institutions like nursing homes or aged care facilities. And all of these places share the same risk to human rights. By putting someone in a box, by putting someone in a facility away from the rest of society, you create inherent risks to their humanity, to their dignity, and you take away their connection from the rest of society. You take away that community. And we have a right to live in the community on an equal basis with others in our old age. We have a right to that community. And our work at Human Rights Watch has been to break down those barriers, to help governments to see, help to pressure governments to see how older people have the same rights, have equal rights to everyone else. We don't change our, our human rights as we grow old. We're born with them, and we hold them until the day we die. And Human Rights Watch, uh, together with the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness, is really working to send that message loud and clear. I'd like to echo something that was said earlier by Elder Albert Marshall. He was talking about isolation, and he talked about how being in isolation means having something to share, but not being able to share it. Think about what it is to be locked away from the rest of the world. Think about what it is to be told you don't. What you have to offer, we don't want that. Kim asks the question all the time, what do we value? Who do we value? And I think, we think, that older people should be valued just like everybody else. Uh, 
Uh, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to begin, um, as is our protocol and our custom, of course, to acknowledge um, the Haudenosaunee, uh, to acknowledge the Anishinaabe and the Huron-Wendat, the nations of whose territory. I know that there was a formal acknowledgement done earlier, and I want to acknowledge the elder uh, for, for the opening. I also want to acknowledge, from my perspective, when we talk about rights um, and at the forefront, uh, a new friend of mine, Kenneth Deer, uh, him and I actually met at an airport this one time. Um, but Kenneth, uh, for those of you who may not know him, uh, has been an instrumental advocate for Indigenous rights, uh, not only here in what the nation would call uh, the nation state being Canada, uh, but certainly around the world. So it's nice to see you, Kenneth, and it's nice to see you, Gabe. Dakhluidi ayahat agayohatu asauk kluan man kai iche. So my name is Kluwani and I'm from the Killer Whale Clan and my Tlingit name is Age. And I'm from Kluwani First Nation, which is a very small community in the Southwest Yukon. 80 people live there, uh, including one of them, uh, my dad, and of course the many others who are my family. I am important that I share this with you because as we have this conversation about rights from an indigenous perspective, uh, it's so important to honor and acknowledge that the rights that we continue to assert that we continue to hold are all pre-existing rights. These are rights that we didn't need anyone to write down for us. They've always existed as part of who we are. And so the rights uh, as being a, an indigenous woman coming from the killer whale clan, the name I hold, there's rights associated with that. There are rights associated with being a citizen of my nation uh, that has a, a modern treaty, if you will, my nation chose to assert our rights and to define them. Uh, that is one path. There are many others that have been taken uh, both across the country and around the world. But I think as we talk about rights, uh, there's one particular, I think, uh, component that I, I really feel is important to share, um, is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I know Kenneth, as I mentioned, was actively involved in that, as well as others, Willie Littlechild, uh, a number of others, Grand Chief Ed John. And when I talked to them a little bit about um, Willie and Ed, about what that meant, it was, it was at a time in particular where our rights weren't understood or even perhaps discussed at the state level, right? Like, there are people around the world, and, and from an indigenous perspective, the rights that we hold, again, I think really hard for other people to understand. Right to education, right to educate our own people, right to language, right to be active players in our own economies and economies of those that are taking place on our territories. When we think about rights in a way, perhaps from a Western colonial worldview, it's a very different way of thinking about it. And I, I share that very from a very personal perspective. As I shared with you, I'm, the clan I'm from and the responsibilities and the rights that I have that are associated with that, and as an indigenous woman, those are really different rights. But when we talk about it from an international perspective, we look at the province of British Columbia, for example, that just enacted legislation to support the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is huge. I think we should, I think we should really acknowledge that. So when we talk about honoring rights, um, I think that that, from an Indigenous perspective, is what's really important. It's not the recognition, it's the honoring of those rights and the rights that we have always had, that we haven't asked anyone for, they've always existed. And so now, uh, you know, I, I think this would be a really important time for all of Canadians and those beyond to really look at how we are going to ensure that those rights are honored and respected here in Canada and beyond. There was a bill that went um, and was unfortunately defeated, Bill 262, uh, that was supporting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so this becomes a moment in time to support that concept of connectedness, that in all the states that you may come from or that you identify as being part of, it is so, so important that as a collective, we ensure that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is honored and respected because that is a really, really key tool in us supporting and advancing our communities um, to be able to assert, be able to honor, uh, and be able to continue to grow and have healthy and sustainable communities. So uh, I'll leave my thoughts and reflections there for now, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I 
think this really important theme that, that Regional Chief Kalani Adamek just articulated so well and was, was a, a thread through all of the comments just now and also Professor Alford is this idea that these rights don't come from governments, they are inherent. These rights are something that we're born with. And this vision of the right to belong is a human birthright, as Kim described this morning. It's not something that a government is going to go and write and entitle people to. So it's a, it's a change in perspective, I think, sometimes as we think about the work of politics um, and think about the work of human rights. So as we think about this notion, though, that these rights are inherent, what specifically can we do at the level of, of national government, at the level of regional government, local government, at the level of um, organizational change in NGOs, change perhaps in private sector organizations? What types of specific policy action in terms of investments, funding decisions, regulatory change would you like to see as part of this agenda to enshrine these, these inherent rights. And I invite you all to, to look at this question you know, in, the, in the prism, in the context of your own work, in your own individual places, or globally at the level of the United Nations system or global corporations or perhaps city governments, whatever level you'd want to think about it. Jean-Nicolas or whoever would like to go first. Just to start with the refugees, because I think that's, uh, that goes back to what you just uh, uh, mentioned, the inherent right. Everybody has the right to uh, leave his, his or her own country if the, that person is persecuted. Persecuted because of who she is, uh, what she believes in, um, and so on and so forth. However, we have to recognize that state have the power to decide whether you enter or not. We see walls being built, we see border being closed, we see people being expelled, uh, we see people being accepted but not given access to school for their children or not given access to med medical care. So it's an inherent in right to seek asylum. It's an inner, you, are, you are refugees by the mere fact of, of your situation, not because the tribunal gives you a paper or because of UNHCR gives you a paper. You are a refugee when you are unable to live in your own place. But we have to recognize, and that's what is uh, happening with our categories of, of person of concern, that states are becoming more and more um, creative, resourceful, in biting into this right, undermining this right. We arrest people when they uh, cross a, a, a border. We may release them when we recognize that they are refugees, but the mere fact that you know that you are going to be arrested may prevent people from crossing the border in the first place and putting themselves or their children at risk of being further discriminated because of who they are, because of their belonging to an indigenous group we, we, that is not a recognized or that is actively persecuted by the state. Uh, so I, I, what, what we need is really um, to uphold, you, you were mentioning pressure, the United Nations does not often do pressure, we do technical support for state <laughs> to help them to do it, it's, it's the other side of the coin and we need the two of, of us uh, at the table, but we need to uphold the standards. And at, at that point, at least from my uh, prism, because Justin, you ask us to look at it from our own perspective, uh, the, the refugee system is being attacked from all sides and corners. Yeah, I think um, in sharing a reflection in terms of, of rights, um, thinking about rights to hunt, rights to fish, uh, I, I recently heard an elder share, if we don't protect the environment, we will not be able to then assert our rights. So when we're talking about ensuring that rights are honored and protected, rights, inherent rights, uh, are both understood, honored, and protected, I think something that we really need to acknowledge here is that if we don't start acting and ensuring that the rights of the planet are honored and protected, then where are we going to be? We're thinking about the animals, you know, the, the two-winged, the fish. 
oftentimes I think we get into conversations about what may feel in some and to some degree a really high level conversation about rights well the reality is that the planet right now we are at risk of perhaps not having a planet in the next 50 years so then what rights does the planet have mother earth and how are we ensuring that those rights are being honored and respected and so while it may seem a little bit off topic in this particular conversation, um, I feel that that is the single most important thing right now that we need to be focused on, is ensuring that the Earth's rights are being honored and protected. The Mother Earth, that we are going to have something that our, our children, I, I don't have children yet, I hope to one day, but if I do have children, I would hope that they would have the ability to hunt and fish the inherent rights that they have, access to language, education, all the things that they're born with. But my concern and my fear is that if we actually don't start having real discussions about taking care of the planet and our response to climate change, then what are we really leaving behind? That is absolutely essential to the conversation today. Yeah, that's the essence of it. Bethany? Um, I'm, I'm also coming from a a formally trained um, legal trades background, um, so I can talk about I can talk about international human rights law um, as it relates to older people. Um, there is no international convention. There is no international agreement about what the human rights of older people are at the global level, at the UN level. Um, there is for people with disabilities, and we, uh, we use that in our advocacy a, a lot. Um, I, the, and I should say that there is a convention on the rights of older persons for this, for this hemisphere, um, for, uh, for in the inter-American system. Um, but that's all very technical. I'd actually like to pull out something that Bill Alford said at, at the beginning um, in his opening about, um, about, how, about how there was this idea 40 years ago that people with disabilities had, uh, didn't really have the right to lay claim to their rights, that they, they were objects of charity as opposed to being the subjects of their own stories with something to offer and something to share. And I would, I would posit that that idea, that idea that we all have something to, sh to share, um, is, is really critical to the way that we think about what, what human rights are. Um, it isn't. It isn't just about this. I, this idea that we all have rights that we can uh, that we can take to the bank. It's. It's about the recognition. It's about a change in the way that we look at each other and see each other for the equals that we all are. Um, so it's. Uh, my answer is not really an answer that's very grounded in what existing international human rights law is. It's more an idea about what the morality is behind it, what the, the reasoning is behind, behind why having um, a recognition, a formal recognition of equal rights is important. We're gonna open it up in just a moment to questions from the audience, so be thinking of your questions. I just want to ask each of you, though, what gives you hope? This is a, a symposium, a gathering that's going to be focused in large part on the relationship between building belonging in our world and building resilience in our world, the relationship between belonging and resilience. And where do you think that we'll find the resilience to make it through and work toward enshrining this right to belong in each of your areas? Just to start, and it's um, very clear with all the categories of people that we are speaking, we are not defined by one element. We are not a person with disability, or we are not a refugee, or we are not a man or a woman or a child or an uh, older person. We are multifaceted. One thing which is important to retain is that for forcibly displaced people, you accumulate the obstacle to claim your rights and to have your inherent right being fulfilled 
uh, by society, by um, governments, by uh, authorities, and, and others around you. Um, I always uh, remember the, the story, we, you work with Help Age, and I was in Northern Uganda when we did a study about domestic violence. And we really thought that we were going to come out with um, stories about violence against women or violence against children. No, it was the older person who were the most uh, subjected to uh, physical violence by their own family member. And we digged into to, to, to understand why. It's because it was a mouse to feed which was not productive. And me, with my white uh, Western uh, conception, I was thinking that in African society, the elders will be respected. They will transmit knowledge. And non in, in the day to day, it was too much for, the, for their own children to feed them and not get something what they felt when not getting something in return. I remember in, uh, in Lebanon ending up um, with a woman coming to, a Syrian refugee woman coming to, to us and said, I don't know what to do with my child. Uh, my child has been, uh, I've uh, uh, attached my child to, 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 my, to, to the bed. The child was, an, uh, was, uh, was with autism, was an autistic child, violent against himself and violence against uh, people around him. As a displaced person, the mother had lost all her network, her belonging, and she didn't know how to deal with the child. And the only solution that she had found was to attach the child to, uh, to the bed. Uh, if we speak about, again, uh, nom uh, indigenous First Nation people, I remember the Bedouin, uh, Bedouin in, uh, in, uh, in between Syria and Lebanon were nomadic people who go, uh, shepherd. They go with their sheep uh, on both sides of the border. When the conflict started, nobody wanted them. They were neither here or there, nor on one side or the other side. And it was extremely difficult for us to advocate the right to remain in Lebanon safe while the country on the other side was going down in, fl in, in flame. So, I know you wanted something about hope, and that's not a very uh, hopeful <laughs> message. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I believe in the resilience of people. I believe in the fact that we are recognizing more and more, you mentioned it before with the uh, person with disabilities, that people have to be agents of their own change, agents of their own life. We need to empower people to become resilient, whether it's to fish and hunt, or whether it is to uh, decide where we are going to build the latrines, or how the latrines should be built to be gender and disability uh, sensitive or friendly. Um, I really believe that we are in a critical moment where we give more uh, power to the people to take charge of their life, but I really see that there is an undercurrent on ultra-conservative and ultra-nationalistic and ultra-anti-Muslim, um, anti anti-gays, anti-whatever, which is really making uh, those rights uh, 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 at stake. What gives me hope is that every day we wake up and we are all one day older. As we grow up and continue to grow up, the reality of what it is and what it can be to be an older person, we'll, we learn a little bit more about that each day. So it is my hope that as we take what we've learned about equality and about justice, and about what it is to be the subject of our own lives. It is my hope that we will take that forward and work for it for others as well. Um, a few, few closing reflections, uh, if I may. Uh, certainly what, what gives me hope is seeing when we have uh, our elders who are sharing their stories, uh, sharing uh, who they are, where they come from, uh, and the protocols and the songs and stories that they have the right to share, uh, that they didn't always have the right to do, unfortunately, in this country. So, thank you, Albert. Um, also, what gives me hope is seeing, and I don't know if those of you uh, in the audience have heard of Autumn Peltier, uh, but she's this amazing young indigenous woman who's actually been acknowledged as a water ambassador by the Anishinaabe 
Uh, she is a now 15-year-old young woman who has spoken at the UN multiple times, uh, who continues to be a water advocate. So across this country, there are people who are still under, live under boil water advisories in Canada. That's real. Uh, and you may not be aware of that, but that is something that is entirely, um, not, not only, I wouldn't describe it as, as problematic, but um, perhaps an inhumane situation for human beings to not have access to water and to have been siloed and to have been moved to live in places that they did not choose um, reserves uh, would be the term that is used. That is something that, um, while it is so hard to, to recognize that we are still very much in that space, I do have hope that we have young people like Autumn, we have elders, we have people like Kenneth who are continuing to fight the good fight, um, but certainly that we have moved in the last five to 10 years and that we still have such a long way to go. But when you see provinces like British Columbia pass that type of legislation, um, that we certainly um, can learn from that. And how do we continue to push and push and push? And so the hope is in our elders, the hope is in our young people, the hope is in our women, our water walkers. Women have the responsibility for water in a lot of our communities and so that gives me hope. Um, it gives me hope to see Gabe continuing her, her journey of her PhD and being able to share our rights uh, across the water uh, with those who she's going to university with. It gives me hope to see some of the young people who are here with Connected North uh, and some of the, the young people who are here that are going to go back to their post-secondary institutions and be able to share that, yeah, those rights are inherent rights and we need to get behind that. So. All of those things give me hope uh, in a world that sometimes seems very dreary, very hard, very cold, very isolated, uh, that there are a lot of teachings that we can take. Uh, and a lot of those teachings, uh, I would say, are very much from the Indigenous worldview, uh, that we are all connected, that we all have a place, that we all have gifts, and that we all have a responsibility to take care of our mother, which in this case is Mother Earth. So thank you. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Questions from you all? My hope is that we will somehow find a way as to change some of those Eric-centric terminologies. Dis disabled, disability. And look at it as another form of an ability. Words like immigrants newcomers, aren't we all part and parcel of this work as our home? Now, in the, in the early 1700s, when we first welcomed the newcomers in our territory, they didn't come there by surprise. We know they were coming. But we made sure of taking that Eric-centric term, treaty, and define it in our own words, which translates Anku Gumpkewe, which translates to uh, you as a new member of our family. These are the responsibilities that you have to not only bring forth, but also demonstrate that you will do everything in your power to look after and maintain the ecological integrity of the area. Because if this is not done, then rights, where do, where do rights come in? See, if everyone could somehow embrace those wonderful words of inclusion, we can become like ants. And when you look at an ant hill, there are no bosses, no kings, no presidents, no, 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 no nobody. Every member of that ant has, has, a, has a sense of responsibility of what they must do of maintaining harmony and balance. To that, to, that, to that hill. So, hi, my name is Philip Oxford. I'm the Dean of International Education at Vancouver Island University. I just want to remind the, everybody two things that are very important that are only beginning to come out. The first is the importance of agency. 
rights could exist, but unless people recognize those rights and then enforce those rights, they're not going to take us very, very far. And in fact, the speakers and many other in, this, in the audience have dedicated their lives to pushing for the recognition of these rights and, and their respect. The second element, which is even more important in some ways, is that we can recognize a right in principle, but what that means in reality is very different. And so there's an element of agency in defining what those rights mean in a meaningful way for the people that are affected by them. It's not a given. It's something that needs to be negotiated. It's something that needs to be discussed. It's something that's going to vary, no matter depending upon who you are, your background, your culture, et cetera. You know, another way of looking at it is that where we live becomes our home because we personalize it. It reflects what our interests are, who we are, what we think is important. And on a collective larger scale, it's the same thing with rights. Rights are only meaningful if we accept them, but then they have to go the next step, which is to actually implement them in ways that are meaningful and valuable to the people that are being affected by them. You know, um, we were having this discussion here about power concedes nothing. And when you think about the right to belong, there's a cost to having people belong. People who belong, if their water's been poisoned, you have to clean it. People who belong have to have some of their land rights restored, right? And so powerful interests are served by non-belonging. It's just how things are. And we, I think, have expected that we could show common humanity and get power to voluntarily recognize belonging, and what I would suggest to you is the election of Donald Trump in the US, he got the highest percentage of the vote in West Virginia, which is the poorest state in the US, right? And which has higher childhood poverty than either Ethiopia or Somalia. And so one of the arguments that we can make to get power to concede for belonging is that there are two choices. Belonging can come for those, by power conceding to those who advocate for inclusion and gentleness and humanity, or ultimately, power is going to have to concede to darker forces because people will not be indefinitely marginalized. They must belong. Great. Hi, I'm Andrea Breen from the University of Guelph. Um, and I just wanted to go back to what you said about um, non-human animals. Um, and the environment. And I'm sort of questioning, you know, if we think about um, who's included in the circle of inclusion and how we have um, sort of human-centric tendencies to not include the animals in our world. And so you mentioned the water, and I think we can also talk about caribou herds um, and animals and how animal suffering is very much related to our own. But even at the domestic level, there's some recent research here in Toronto where they asked women who are leaving abusive relationships why they chose not to leave, and 56% talk about the companion animals. They can't take them into shelters. Um, often people's animals are their closest relationship. So just I'm curious about sort of limitations, risks, and benefits of focusing on humans and how we might sort of bring the other relationships that we have into <coughs> movements as well. Um, yeah, so my question for you all is about the enforceability of human rights specifically, and it's two-pronged, and that I want to focus on top-down enforcement and also bottom-up. So I'm wondering what sort of decentralized institutions or civil society institutions um, need to be uh, made or developed in order to enforce human rights, and also what sort of amendments can be made at the UN level maybe to the rhetoric and United Nations declarations and treaties in order to include people like older people um, and other factions of society that are largely misrepresented or underrepresented. Thanks for the question, Dean. Um, <clears throat> there is actually work towards uh, an international convention on the human rights of older people that, that's ongoing. Um, and I think, that, I think that having those rights uh, specifically articulated is really important because if you have to make the argument for why a set of rights should apply to you in a certain circumstance, you've sort of already lost the battle, <laughs> if not the war. Um, it's really important to be able to explain exactly how older people's rights are specific to them. Um, but to your question about uh, to your question about enforcement mechanisms as well, um, I think that it is that it's equally uh, critical that we have you know vibrant democracies that we have. Um, people who are engaged and understand and are and are 
in a position to assert their rights if, if they have them, as well as having a functioning system of government that does the right thing and, and, um, and puts the systems in place that need to be in place. Just to add, I, I, I really believe in the decentralization. We have uh, been focusing a lot on the center, uh, on the central state. If you look, cities are a key element in ensuring that the rights are being uh, fulfilled uh, for refugees, for immigrants, for people without a, a residency status, whether it's to make sure that the kids are in school or to make sure that there's affordable housing. So uh, we have developed a lot of uh, initiative where we look at what are the lower level of government which can come into play and help the realization of the right of different categories, including uh, refugees. The work has started uh, in the 80s with UNDP, in particular in Asia, much more now in, and in Latin America, where that has been very predominant. Uh, I think we, we should look beyond just the central state. But one step further, we should look also at non-state entities. The private sector is running the show in many, many things often as far more uh, means when we are speaking about access to potable water. Sure, it's a responsibility of the state and we should not let them off the hook, never. But there may be other entities who are ready to step in if they recognize that, because you mentioned there is a cost about belonging, and you are right, but there is also a benefit of making people to belong. Refugees in North America or in, I mean, in, in the US or in Canada bring, when they are resettled here, or when they come and claim asylum and are recognized as, as refugees. In the U.S., it takes 10, 10 years for them to pay more taxes than what it costed the state to bring them to the United States. In Canada, it's a bit longer because there's more services provided here, but it takes 20 years. So even if you want to be completely cynical and look only at the economic argument, making them belong is a good return on investment because they are going to give you more. Refugees in Canada create more jobs for themselves and other Canadians than any other Canadian. So we need to engage also different partners and the private sector beyond the municipalities and, and the province and the regional and the communities themselves. I think the private sector is really key in this uh, issue. And it's difficult for us because we come with a different language and probably different values, but I think that we can find uh, uh, consent, uh, yeah, a, a platform. Thank you. We're just about out of time. Chief Kulani, would you like to say any brief words? Yeah, I think, um, and perhaps I'll, I'll break it down from kind of a, an international to kind of more of a, uh, a local national perspective. I think internationally, certainly, um, the Paris Accord uh, needs to be something that everybody uh, around the world honors and recognizes so that we're able to actually get to uh, net carbon zero by 2050, if not earlier. Um, in terms of the, the mechanism to, to hold us to account, uh, you know, this becomes, I think, about really how people are engaged in, in this work uh, from a, a local and regional perspective. So when we're talking about um, Canada, for, for example, as a nation state, um, first and foremost, legislation um, that recognizes uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, that is a must, and we've heard that from uh, Indigenous communities across the country. Um, from a, a treaty perspective, and, and as mentioned, I come from a modern treaty. There are 11 number treaties. There are treaties that existed before Canada became Canada. Like, there's a lot there. Uh, and, and those... Um, rights that were perhaps articulated in those treaties or the inherent rights that existed before those treaties because the treaty doesn't define the rights for us, we define those rights or those rights are already pre-existing. Um, that there needs to be a mechanism to hold the state accountable. And, and I've heard this across the country. Now, from a northern perspective, this would be, uh, and our chiefs have, have talked about a, uh, a treaty implementation um, uh, commission um, that would exist. Um, and again, I think from a, a, a regional to community perspective, that may differ. Uh, but certainly from the north, that is something that, um, that leadership has been uh, pushing for. Uh, we talk about uh, the right to water. Um, there's, there's no way that as human beings, we can continue to be okay 
with the fact that not every single person in this country has access to water, has access to a school, and from an Indigenous perspective has access to who we are in terms of culture and language and providing communities what they need to be able to advance based on their solutions. So I think if, if anything, and we're talking about what mechanism needs to exist, uh, and I heard a SAMI leader um, talk about this, um, who's from um, over the water, um, nothing for us without us. So when we're talking about solutions, we're talking about connectedness, right? We're talking about what mechanism can exist. There's a whole bunch of different mechanisms to hold people to account. But when it comes to, to, to creating solution and ad solutions and advancing priorities, nothing for us without us has to be always, always considered. And the problems that we've experienced and the issues that we're seeing with respect to rights not being honored and respected, a lot of the times, time comes from you know, that mere fact that the people whose rights are being dishonored or not respected are not included at all in the systems that are creating them. So I would like to perhaps leave you with that. Um, it's, it's been a great honor to join you. I wanted to, to particularly thank, thank Kim um, for the invitation. Kim's a, a dear friend. I know she's a dear friend to many, uh, but it was in 2014 that the first um, symposium was held and I was uh, joined at that time as well. And it's so great to see um, this grow, Kim. Uh, it's great to have you as an ally. And I think that uh, this, this gathering, if you will, this symposium uh, and the ability that it has to both connect people uh, but also connect people to action is so incredibly important. So we'd like to ask all of you to, to continue to be, uh, if, not you, if you're not already, that you continue to support uh, Indigenous peoples with respect to the UN Declaration. And if you have questions about any of those parameters, I might invite you to ask Ken, because he is one of the masterminds um, behind that. And, and I wanted to thank you again, Ken. Really grateful to the three of you. Oh, yeah. We've got time for one more. I'm hearing, yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, my name's Ben Hack. Um, yeah, um, human rights, it's a, how can I say it? It's a fascinating subject for me. Um, how can I say it? Like, the reason why I find it fascinating is, well, I'm part of Special Olympics. I also got a disability. I also work in the disability industry in my local country. I'll give you an example. I'm from Australia, right? So according to the UN, according to all the mandates, fundings, laws, everything should be great, right? Because they all, Australia meets every single one of those. Yet every day when I go home, I see human rights violations. I see people that are coming into our, into our disability service that have been kicked out of every school, that, you know, don't have any friends. I mean, um, Dr. Alfred talked about 40 years ago, the, the uh, stuff with disability is seen as a charity. It's still seen like that today. In fact, I would go probably even worse than that. I mean, the problem with disability starts when we get diagnosed. It's the whole paradigm. And you, you can talk to parents about that, they'll tell you is that pretty much we set the dial so low on the expectations and then it just goes through your life. That's the journey. So for me, what I see when, when I'm in the disability service is I've seen that dial and the experiences go all the way through their life, all the way through school. Now, in saying that, there are good things that happen. But the problem with that is it's like me, like the second half of my life's been really great, right? And we celebrate that. But the problem is it's not systemic. And for me, I don't believe it's human rights. I don't believe the answer is laws, fundings and mandates on their own. I think the real answer is we've got to educate people on how to value people and how to understand people. And we've got to get rid of these notions, particularly for disability, but I think we do it with anyone, but particularly disability, on the idea that we know exactly what someone can do or can't do. And I think that's something we've got to get rid of. So the question I have for you guys is, how do we convince 
big government, big corporates, big industries to value that. Well, we get people like you to run. I mean, I would say um, from my perspective, uh, it can often feel like you're continuing to share your story and experiences on deaf ears. Um, and I think this has been the story of our peoples um, for, for a very long time. However, um, when you're coming at things from a rights-based approach, uh, and that certainly from you know, being a, or an elected regional chief for a national advocacy organization, the Assembly of First Nations. Um, that always, I think, becomes for me, uh, first and foremost, is what's the, where, where are rights considered in this conversation, right? Because that really, at the end of the day, which I think links us back to some of the, the, the really strong reflections and experiences that were shared on this panel, being able to educate people, being able to remind people about how important it is to have a heart-centered approach, seeing people like Greta Thunberg, who's traveled around the world talking about something that is very real, being very honest, showing integrity and respect, the values in which oftentimes we see people who are in elected positions uh, forgetting about. Uh, I think that becomes the ability that we have as human beings to remind people uh, as gently or as strongly as we need to, uh, but always respectfully, as our elders would say, you do everything in a good way. So whether you're telling someone that they really are not, it is inappropriate, or what they've done isn't right, or they need to listen, there are ways that you can do that in a good way. And so that would be uh, my reflection and, and, and that I would share is that how can you, through the work that you're doing, continue to remind people, tell people, this isn't okay, it doesn't recognize or honor rights, but I'm gonna do it in a good way. And being able to get, I think, the young people, and I'm, I'm looking at a lot of other young people like myself in this room, that this is also going to become something that is going to be incredibly important for us. Because the more that we understand those rights, and the more that we're telling the little ones what their rights are, right, you're going to see an entire generational shift. Uh, and so that would be my suggestion. First, run. Second, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but really, truly, um, for myself, stepping into this role, 30-some-year-old woman stepping into a regional chief. We've had two women in the Yukon be regional chiefs, but in Ontario and Alberta, this was the first time ever that they had women elected into this position. So, which is exciting, right? It is. So the point is, let's get, let's be open to vulnerability then. And I know Kim has talked about this before, but let's be a little more open to that vulnerability so that we can help other people understand how to be more open to vulnerability so that they can better then understand how to have a better heart-centered approach. So um, I could talk on and on about this, but I know we're limited for time. Um, but those would be my reflections, and I hope that may have been helpful for you. I, think I, I just wanted to, to, to complement what uh, Kluania said. I think speak up, speak up, speak up. Because I... My generation has become a bit complacent. We had all the treaties, the human rights from the, from the UN and so on. We saw that it was given, democ democratization was expanding uh, outside the, the Western Wall. We, we saw that uh, um, people were going to have a say about uh, matters which affect their, their life. And I think. Uh, Especially here in, uh, in North America, Jessica has heard me saying it uh, uh, often, we have been very complacent and we have thought that the wind could not shift because we had strong institutions. The Supreme Court will never uh, let that happen. The democratic ins we can rule out the, ne the MPs by not voting for them the next election. And we have seen that it is not true. The wind turns very quickly. We have seen it with the, with the refugees. There was a huge uh, movement to Europe in 2015. Doors were open. People were going to the train station. A year later, Germany is electing ultra conservatives, far right uh, MP, right, left, and center. Um, so speak up, speak up. Don't take things for granted. And the second thing, which um, unfortunately it's, it's intellectually more difficult, but look at intersectionality of, of, of right. We, we are all fighting our little battles, 
and sometimes under my, without we, uh, doing it in, a, in a, uh, uh, without knowing that we are doing it, we may undermine others. And we are never just a woman or just a person with disability or just an indigenous person. We are multi, we are multifaceted, and we need to do this exercise intellectually to look at how we address the things f from multiple angles with multiple partners. The youth, the private sector, the cities, the government, the indigenous communities, the disability movement, and so on and so forth. Don't stay within your sphere, your comfort zone. Get out and speak up. I would, I would absolutely echo the, the comments of the other panelists. Um, and I would, I would only add that um, I got back from a trip to Australia five days ago. Um, so if you're jet lagged, I am too. Um, and, uh, and we were talking with, you know, Human Rights Watch does, we do research. Uh, we did it together with the Samuel Center for Social Connectedness. Um, in this case, talking about um, abuses against older people in <coughs> aged care facilities in three states in Australia. And we went, to, we went to the government, and we went to MPs, and we went to senators. Um, we talked with people from the private sector, and we talked with some amazing advocates that are working hard on these issues day in and day out. There are good people out there. And in addition to standing up and being counted and running for yourself, which I think is a great idea, always. Um, give light to the good work that other people around you are doing because they, um, they're fighting the same battles that, that you are. Um, and together, together we're much stronger. My name's um, Peter Stewart. I'm, um, I'm actually from a place called the Eden Project, which is tucked away down southwest in um, the UK. Um, it's more of a kind of a statement and reflection of the morning, really, than a question, because so, I know I'm holding you up before lunch, so it's got to be um, quick. Um, it's kind of response to certainly what you've just said there, Bethany, in terms of learning from others in there, um, also from um, answering in terms of regional chief there, your, your concern there about the environment and, and that the context and actually the hourglass has been turned. So all of this stuff about rights has to be done incredibly quickly. Um, the lady over there who talked about the issues to do with animals and so forth and, and bringing that all, all into play. I just wanted to say about the learning from others. Um, I just um, happened to um, be invited over to uh, Rwanda at the end of um, July for three days um, and um, we were considering doing some work over there um, but what I saw in that kind of three days um, was issues when you think about 25 years after the genocide of uh, the genocide of the Tutsis where a million people were wiped out in a hundred days um, and then you see what has happened to those citizens and how they've kind of come together and the journey that they are on you kind of look at that, in, in, and when you talk about the question about hope, I came away there on one day where I had to stand up and do a response to actually seeing two people on stage, one who was a perpetrator of genocide, who had murdered this lady's family, and the reconciliation that happened in, in that space. I just saw in one day the worst of humanity and actually the best of humanity, all in kind of one day. And I just, they have, a, they have a word there, which I will not pronounce why, because I come from Cornwall. Um, and it's Ubumuntu, but you don't pronounce the T. And what it means um, for those of that, of that continent, Will, is, is what it is to be human, good heart, and understanding what it is to be human. When we talk about the issues to do with the dogs and the environment and the hourglass and Greta Thunberg and all those things, one of the questions, one of the things that I learned just in that, th those three days was here is a country of 12 million people the size of Wales and it's been through probably one of the worst things that we've seen in our kind of living memory and yet you walk into a place that has no plastic bags, it is clean, 
its vegetation and the way that they, they feed themselves is incredible. Um, and you can't, those wonderful people like McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken and all those people, they, they don't get in. They don't get in, they try to get in, but they can't. Because actually the culture of the whole place says, it's fine actually, we know what we're doing here. And so in there you find something which is really, really kind of special. And, and, and when you think about the right to belong, in there, the lens will be put on that country in June of next year, because that is where the next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting is going to be had. And that, I think, is a really, really good opportunity for everybody to look at it and say, you know, what I've learned here just in a few hours is immense. And what we could possibly learn from that going into June, it going into June of next year, could be absolutely amazing. So um, thank you very much, Kim, and, um, and full respect to um, some of the stuff I've heard today. It's been absolutely terrific, but I'm stopping you from having lunch, so thank you. <laughs> So grateful to the three of you and grateful to everyone here for this extraordinary participation. I think it's really um, heartening to see how this, through all these different issues and challenges and sectors, this common vision emerging of how we build belonging, this connection to people, to place, to power and purpose. And I'm so glad that we have more time to dig deeper into these issues and other issues and topics in the days to come. Thank you so much for your attention and time, and thanks for being here.